before giving you an idea of the work itself to locate myself as your guest on the subject. Uh, as you said, I was introduced to his work while I was still a teenager by a university roommate. And I knew in attempting to read that first book, which I got about halfway through the first time, called Character Analysis, that I was reading the work of somebody who was unlike anybody who I had ever read before that. And I was a, a very inquisitive kid. I grew up in a reading family. I loved the world of books and knowledge and coming of age in the 60s. This really appealed to me. But it wasn't for another 10 years that I really got involved in the work. 10 years of reading made it come alive intellectually. But at a certain point, I learned that Dr. Reich's first assistant for the last 11 years of his life, and he passed in 1957, was alive and well, certainly in his 70s at the time, but still practicing as a medical organomist and to terms. The science that Reich established, he called organomy. It's a word that simply is a hybrid word between organism, orgasm, the operating functioning principle of which is how energy functions in the living and non-living realm. So that organomy as a science, because it's about how energy functions, cuts across literally every other area of science, even ones that seem somewhat disconnected, and including social thinking. Everything from cancer formation to how star systems form, to raising a healthy child, to sociopolitical movements, to human functioning, it sweeps across the subjects. And I studied organomist was the term that he coined for the therapists that do the work. Now, I should say here that anybody in the world with any kind of degree or not in mental health or otherwise can simply declare themselves a Reichian therapist by just doing it. <laughs> a medical organomist is a physician who has become a psychiatrist who then goes through X number of years of being trained in the method that Reich developed to work with people and help release the constrictions on them, physiological as well as mental, they are folks who are extremely well-trained. And again, realizing that Dr. Baker, Dr. Ellsworth F. Baker, was alive and well at that time, I set out to meet him and ended up going into that therapy for almost seven years. At the time, I was very fortunate there were courses on the social and scientific aspects of Reich's work that were taught at New York University, where I studied and then joined a seminar on the subject. I was also a volunteer fundraiser in the organization that actually became a brick and mortar group in this country, the American College of Organomy in Princeton, New Jersey. And my involvement in UFO studies connected me with the most troubling for people within organomy and difficult to deal with aspect of Reich's work, namely, toward the end of his career in developing weather modification, a device that, that very solidly did modify the weather and for the better if properly used, and we'll get into that more later, Greg, that it attracted UFO activity. And Reich had the courage, and I guess to a degree the naivete to publish around that, even though backed up by the observations of local people and colleagues mm -hmm. and scientifically noted during all the observations, it was still used very effectively to help identify him in the popular imagination as a quack. He thought he could modify the weather. He you know, saw UFOs, etc. I've also had the privilege and pleasure of speaking at Reich conferences around the world most recently this past summer in Athens, Greece. So where do we stand here? Orgonomy itself offers groundbreaking applications in fields as diverse as biology, psychology, meteorology, sociology, cancer research, human sexuality, political science, UFO studies. But some of its key findings challenge accepted physical laws. 
And this was something that caused a brief connection with Albert Einstein and then a split with him in 1940. It also challenges some of society's most significant social and moral underpinnings. And for many, this is unforgivable. Hence, the biases that we see in his work. So as far as a sketch of his life, Reich was born in 1897 in what's now the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Mm -hmm. And as in all people, great and modest, early childhood experiences add up. His father was a very stern bureaucrat, his mother very sensitive and artistic piano teacher. Willie, as he was called as a child, and his brother Robert grew up on a rural estate, observing nature at every turn, including, you know, animals having sex. This was just part of his basic life and not something special. He was half Christian, half Jewish by birth but never practiced either religion and grew to observe that in his mind, all organized religions tend to be more of a source of ignorance and suffering than enlightenment or happiness. Cheers to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I guess one could say that the critical moment in his adolescence was as a teenager coming upon his mother and her lover and being so upset and so confused and so troubled about it that he brought the subject to the attention of his father, who came town like 10 tons on his mother, who committed suicide. His father, guilt-ridden, stood out in a storm until he got pneumonia and passed away. This is how he came through his teenage years. I think as a psychotherapist, one of the things that it gave him was a tremendous depth of compassion and understanding about the human condition and how difficult things could be in just growing up intact. Mm -hmm. 1914, the First World War begins. He enlists in the Austro-Hungarian military and for the next four years fights in World War I. He is an artillery officer. And by 1918 and the end of the war, old Europe has been blown into oblivion. There is no more state to go back to. There is no money. There is nothing. His brother is still alive. But for him, as an extremely bright young man with an eye toward the sciences, he enrolls in medical school in Vienna, where he supports himself as a tutor for other medical students. Now, can any of us imagine what it must have been like to be in Vienna in medical school in 19, 20, 21, whenever, and hearing more and more about this brilliant, pioneering man of science and the human condition named Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. And Reich was certainly drawn to Freud's work. And after graduating from medical school, he presented himself to Freud, so to say, became a pupil of his, then went on to become one of his inner circle and in fact worked as Freud's primary first assistant for the next six years. The two of them parted ways in about in 1929, when Reich, after much clinical work and observation in the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition that was being developed at that time, presented case findings to Freud supporting his view that literally all human neuroses at their deepest levels were rooted in some kind of sexual dysfunction, malaise, pathology, absence thereof, however you want to see it. Freud, of course, had become famous for his theory that some, if not many, if not most, human neuroses had their roots in a sexual basis. But all of them, uh, I think for Freud himself, who... <laughs> And I don't mean to play games with language now, but at that point was emerging from his pioneering, brilliant, young, idealistic self to become the great Sigmund Freud mm -hmm. and an institution, so to say, also in Victorian, somewhat prim Vienna at that point in the early 20s. This was too much of a stretch. And they went their ways. Reich was not able to persuade Freud of his point of view at least to the point that Freud could publicly accept it, although who knows what he felt privately. 
Reich's departure from the Freudian ranks created kind of a backlash of resentment among many of his colleagues, many of them who went on to become the best known of that first wave of Freudians. And it was here that the myth of Reich's mental instability began. Mm. Um, and it was something that would follow him for the rest of the life. But why did the Freudians in the circle who closed around Freud after Reich's departure feel that he was mentally ill? Well, because he had left Freud in the Freudian circle. Surely that in itself was an indication of it. I mean, give me a break. Huh. But at this point, the so-called great social experiment going on in the Soviet Union, yes, it was totalitarian government. Yes, it was the origins of modern communism. But many people still held out hope that the revolution might evolve to become something of a genuine, you know, workers' state with justice for all and all of that, of course, and nothing could have been further from the truth. However, it was right in that window of time that Reich decided, well, the communists are willing to allow me to do my work in a sponsored setting. And so he joined the Austrian Communist Party in 1927, intending on marrying the revolutionary mission of their already existing mental health clinics, which they had around the country, to helping to restore healthy sexually functioning in couples, in workers who were primarily uneducated factory people. So these clinics were called sex poll, simple hybrid word between sex and politics clinics. And they were extended from Austria into Germany and into the Soviet Union. And Reich began to work with the therapists that he trained in and directly working with workers in helping them restore what he termed a meaningful sexual equilibrium. Well, horror of horrors for the communists as couples would actually begin to become what I would term emotionally healthier and build more and more of their lives on this wonderful thing at the center of their relationship, a loving sexual reality, their first concern shifted from production quotas and the revolutionary principles of the party and fulfilling their jobs as cogs in the great machine of scientific socialism to each other and to raising healthy, happy children. This caused the communists to boot Reich out of the party and to extend the myth of his insanity, because how could he possibly be a decent socialist human being and put individuals before the needs of society? <laughs> from that point on, Reich became an avowed anti-communist and was expelled from the party officially in 1934. So where does this leave him now? I'm bringing up a quote here to give our listeners a sense of where this extraordinary man stood at this point in his life. And this is the quote. This is what I am fighting for, the prevention of emotional human misery by the establishment of a normal and natural, that is, orgastically satisfying human life in the masses of people. Now, I don't have to tell you, Greg, that to any group or individuals intent on controlling the lives of others in any number of ways, these are the words of a truly dangerous man. Right. The party never forgave him for this and would go on to help to damage his reputation in a way almost to death later on in his life. So driven from Austria, then from Germany, he emigrated to Norway and he did it just under the wire. When I was deeply involved in studying his life history and had access in the 70s and primarily the 80s to a surprising number of people who knew him, studied with Reich, had been his patients, students, etc. One of the stories that emerged was as he got through customs to emigrate to Norway, it was literally within weeks of Hitler's having consolidated power in Germany and Stalin becoming more and more aware of how dangerous Reich was potentially 
to explaining the true dynamics of communism. Mm -hmm. And both of these men knew who Reich was and wanted him dead. And the story goes that as he was leaving Germany, the customs official realized who he was and could at that point have had him arrested or detained, ending up in a camp and a footnote to history. And that customs official, for whatever number of reasons, turned the other way and Dr. Reich got out. In Norway, aided by a core group of colleagues, he devoted much of his work and study to the dynamics of cancer formation. Let me jump out for a moment here and observe that for most people who have heard Dr. Reich's name, they've heard it, you know, maybe on a radio show like yours or in a documentary, or they've read something about him in an article or somebody's book or, you know, heard somebody give a lecture on him. But the great number of people who know his name have never read a single word of any book that he ever wrote or any of the hundreds of articles or monographs he ever wrote. He was an incredibly prolific writer. And there, at the time of his death in 1957, there were some tens of thousands of pages of unpublished material in his estate. I don't know how many of his books have been published, 20 or more certainly, but it was at this time that his outstanding books, The Impulsive Character, Character Analysis, People in Trouble, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and The Cancer Biopathy were all written during this period. In considering the work he was doing in getting um, to some of the essentials of cancer formation, this with the understanding, of course, that there are certain kinds of cancers that are environmental, hereditary, and caused by other factors, but there are other cancers that are aided by or have emotionally driven bases that the resignation of the human bioenergetic system, the characterologically breathing more shallowly for most of your life and making parts of your body more oxygen starved than others will create sites where cancer loves to attach itself and form. In Norway, again, people who heard about his work but did not educate themselves to it. Lay people, people of science alike, began to wonder about this guy, and a rather nasty campaign emerged in the press, kind of a a, a sign of signs to come of the terrible campaign against him in the American press in the late 40s and into the 50s. But in 1939, Dr. Reich was invited to join the faculty of New York City's New School for Social Research. And so in 40, he emigrated to the United States, where he settled in Forest Hills, Queens, a then very quiet district of the borough where I was born in New York City. And it's here that he established a private practice. He continued his writing. He refined his character analytic therapy, as he called it at the time. And energetic functioning in people was now his primary interest. And his key efforts directed toward, I can best say, dissolving the chronic muscular contractions in his patients. And I think for anybody, whether or not this kind of work is familiar for you or not, visualize yourself growing up or somebody else. And at a certain point, they experience a very rough period or a tragedy or a totally traumatic moment or time in their life. We withdraw to our core in a way. We we shut down. We We respire less. We become more defensive, actually and physiologically. And when these things happen and you become more resigned to, oh, well, who's ever really happy in life? Who really has an ecstatic sex life? Whose dreams ever really come true? I guess it's just a matter of settling and, you know, who's ever really happy? And what does the word mean anyway? And Mm -hmm. I think I need more starchy and sugary foods and to watch more television and just (laughs) get real with the world. That we do create physical armor in our musculature that it sort of reestablishes itself. It sets in. 
it holds us in place. And the kind of therapy that Reich designed, which is, I think, absolutely brilliant, and not to be confused with many of the so-called Reichian techniques, but medical orgone therapy per se, is about attacking and breaking down this musculature armor and allowing people to respire at a deeper level, to become enraged if, you know, they've kind of lost the ability to be angry. And it's very important for a healthy person to be angry. Anyway, these were the main things that he was involved in at this point in his work. And then in his laboratory work, in looking for a possible way to measure or calibrate what he called orgone energy, he developed a very simple device. Let me also say here that the term orgone energy is a generic term. It's about the sea of energy in which we live that animates all living things. The Hindus called it the prana. The Victorians called it the ether. Right. It's been given different names, but it's not some weird thing that he came up with. It's simply the way he identified it scientifically. The apparatus that he created is called the Orgone Energy Accumulator. His other term for it was the ORAC. And I forget what the acronym was, but the Orgone Energy Accumulator is often referred to as an Orgone Box, which to anybody involved in the work is somewhat demeaning and insulting and an improper term. What the accumulator does is that by a very simple method, so simple that official science has rejected it and never bothered to replicate Reich's tests, proving his point that it does focus and intensify energy. It's simply layers of organic and inorganic material in a box-like form. It can be as big as a shoebox, which you could use for seed germination or other experimental uses, or as large as, say, a old-fashioned phone booth that you can sit in. Reich built and designed a room on his property in Maine later in life to function as an accumulator. And I know Dr. James DeMeo, who runs the Orgone Biophysical Research Laboratory, which anybody can Google and learn more about. And I should say it's up in the Northeast, closer to you than, uh, Northwest, closer to you than me. The Orgone Biophysical Research Laboratory, you can also Google OBRL or the Green Springs Laboratory just outside of beautiful Ashland, Oregon. Dr. DeMeo has also built a room in which there are separate accumulators, but the room itself is an accumulator. So how do they work? Organic material holds energy, whether it's wood or clay or cotton. Mm -hmm. Inorganic material reflects energy, whether it's sheet metal or screening or steel wool. So you could build an accumulator out of layers of plywood and steel wool, or out of layers of homosote, the kind of heavy gauge board that you can buy at a lumber yard, and cotton batting, or out of pine panels and sheet metal. The strength of an accumulator is determined by the number of layers. This summer, when I was in Greece staying with a, a good friend after the conference I spoke at, she had a accumulator that you could sit in that I believe was 12 layers of alternating metal and wood. The metallic layer, as I recall, needs to be on the inside. The organic layer, yeah, on the outside. And when you sit in one of these devices, which I've been doing on and off since I was in my 20s, and you relax, depending on how light sensitive it is, many of them have openings, you know, for air, or as you can see out of, or maybe in a completely dark environment, you begin to feel a slight tingling on your skin, 
a slightly elevated sense of energy in your body. And if it's in complete darkness, you will ultimately see what Reich called spinning waves, mm. these tiny little endless particles of light that will just spin like a corkscrew for a second and then disappear. We see similar things if we allow ourselves to kind of get past our grown-up conditioning and, let's say, lie on your back on the grass in a quiet area and look up at the sky. As children, we see these things automatically, that the sky is filled with energy. When you bring it to the attention of an adult, they will explain to you that you are seeing things or that it's just some this or that, but not actual real energy in the sky when it really is. Hmm. Again, the size of the accumulators really determines their power, but they do work and it is a real scientific principle. However, because they don't plug into anything, because they don't have a motor attached to them, because they don't run on some kind of chemical thing, they have simply been dismissed outright as quackery by establishment science. And as we see with the ridicule factor in UFO studies, is a very similar one here. And one could argue the same for some of the brilliant Nikola Tesla's discoveries and findings during his lifetime. But for that kind of mind, the mantra is, it can't be, therefore it isn't, therefore it's something else. And it's obvious that this guy was some kind of sex quack who believed in hocus pocus alternate energy and flying saucers. And in that sense, is easy to dismiss. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is for any of you folks listening to this radio show and, you know, Greg has a, an amazing history as a broadcaster and bringing topics to the public attention, which are certainly outsider topics. For most of you, I hope this will be at the least an interesting couple of hours of radio. Mm -hmm. But there will be some of you who will say, hmm, I have heard about Dr. Reich's work. I've heard different things about him. But you know what? I am one of those people who has never actually read any of his books. Maybe I should read a book or two by him and see if this work is as engaging for me as it seems to be for Peter Robbins here and start to learn more about it and see if this is something that I could value and learn from and gain a fuller, happier life from. Mm -hmm. And that is something I encourage anyone of your listeners to do. More about the energy, though, because orgone energy is identified by Reich didn't follow or doesn't follow all the normal laws of, you know, like ACDC current and more conventional energetic sources that we're familiar with. Right. Unlike conventional energy systems we are accustomed to thinking in terms of, in which like electrical, conventional electrical energy, the energetic potential moves from the stronger system or the source to the weaker one. Orgone energy flows from the weaker system to the stronger, and that's very important to keep in mind. Again, Reich is now, uh, it's the early 1940s. He's living and working in this quiet borough of New York City, and he is continuing his experiments, which he hopes will, in a scientific way, in a laboratory setting, allow him to isolate and confirm the reality of this kind of energy. He's also aware of the controversy an announcement of such a discovery might create in conventional scientific circles. So he continues to verify his findings without seeking or public acknowledgement or other official scientific verifications. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the experiments he develops, and it's one that as a layperson, I replicated many years ago, and that's another exciting thing about Reich's scientific work, that he makes certain claims. And with rare exceptions, anybody who studies the work and who has even the most basic sense of conducting an experiment, which you don't need, you know, even a high school education to do, you can verify for yourselves the results of the experiments that he developed. And this one, which he named TO minus T, was calculated to measure the actual heat differential 
inside of an orgone accumulator when compared with an identical size control box. Now, for some people, this is like ho-hum stuff. For me, it was terribly exciting to think, wow, if this is true, then not only does it show in scientific terms what I experience when I sit in an accumulator and what other people have reported as well, but it does it in a way that official science would really have to contend with. And in fact, he does create this experiment and replicates it successfully on a number of occasions, as do colleagues of his following the exact same series of protocols. Again, it would be about building a small orgone energy accumulator, X number of layers of organic and inorganic material, but nothing else going on with it, and a control box, the exact same size and dimension, each with a thermometer inserted in a prescribed way to read on a daily basis. So he fulfills these experiments, and then we come to a rather remarkable moment in his life and history, where in December of 1940, he sends a carefully worded letter about his work, specifically focusing in on the TO minus T experiment to Dr. Albert Einstein, arguably the best known scientist in the world at this time. Mm -hmm. The actual letter, Greg, written in German, says in part, and I'm quoting here, several years ago, I discovered a specific biological energy, which in many ways behaves differently from anything that is known about electromagnetic energy. The matter is too complicated and sounds too improbable to be explained clearly in a brief letter. I can only indicate that I have evidence that this energy, which I have called orgone, exists not only in living organisms, but also in the soil and in the atmosphere. It is visible and can be concentrated and measured. And he put that in italics. That was his emphasis. And I am using it with some success in research on cancer therapy, end quote. Well, hmm. exactly. Six days later, he received a response from Dr. Einstein inviting him to demonstrate this claim in person in his laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. Now, for those people who have read treatments of Reich's life and said, oh God, he thought, you know, the commies were out to get him and then the FDA was out to get him and then official science and he was paranoid and, you know, thought the government was watching him and things. Well, all these things were actually true. And it's important to note here that the meeting was arranged through Einstein's secretary assistant, a woman named Helen Dukas, and it was set for January 31st, 1941. Now, that afternoon, Reich had driven from, from Queens, New York, to Princeton, and the two men met together for more than four hours. During that time, Reich actually demonstrated his findings with the laboratory equipment he had brought for Einstein. And more, they observed the glowing orgone energy together through a laboratory apparatus that Reich had designed for the purpose. And it does glow in a laboratory setting, this basic energy in a beautiful light blue. The physicist, Einstein that is, acknowledged the glow that he was seeing, but refused to rule out what he described as the subjective element. Toward the end of his meeting with Reich, he noted that he said to Reich that if true, and he was seeing it for himself, it would be a great bomb. The understanding there was to physics. He asked, because among other things, what he was seeing violated a little something called the second law of thermodynamics, which is that equal volumes tend to equalize in temperature. And in fact, they were not doing so in TO minus T. He asked Reich to loan him the equipment that he had brought so that he could continue to replicate these experiments for himself. And I'm bringing up another quote here because although I'm well versed in this material and obviously, you know, can talk about it pretty much freewheelingly, quotations are important. And in anticipation of their meeting, Reich had written in his notes, quote, 
orgone constitutes the field that Reich is searching for. Electricity, magnetism, gravitation, etc., depends on its functions. So, again, Reich loans him the equipment, and Einstein spends the next week conducting and studying and replicating again and again T O minus T. And on February 7th, I mean, this is all moving very quickly, he wrote to Reich that he had confirmed and reconfirmed Reich's findings. The accumulator repeatedly registered an average of 0.3 to 0.4 degrees centigrade higher in the control box. Amazing. Hmm. It was at this time, however, that one of Einstein's assistants offered a simple explanation for the temperature differential, and in fact, a much too simple explanation, that it was caused by convection, or that is the difference between the air temperatures under and above the table the accumulator and the control box had been set on. Einstein closed his letter to Reich relative to this. I hope this will awaken your sense of skepticism (laughs) so that you will not allow yourself to be deceived by an illusion that can be easily explained. Please have someone pick up your instruments since they are of some value. They are undamaged. With friendly greetings, A. Einstein. Sadly, this was the last actual communication that passed between the two of them. Although this discussion continued on for some years between in correspondence between their assistants. And that volume is available from a very unique bookstore, the one at the Wilhelm Reich Museum, which is in Rangeley, Maine. It is the location of his last residence, his estate, his laboratory, his workshop, his home. And it's called The Einstein Affair and is fascinating reading in German and English, everything translated for anybody that's interested. But how did Reich respond? He wrote back, of course, that the strict protocols that he had established eliminated such false explanations, even describing how he had repeatedly and successfully conducted the experiment with both boxes buried underground, thus eliminating any possibility of so-called convection. Unfortunately, by this time, Einstein seems to have lost all interest. Reich thought it memorable that the physicist had been so willing to accept the first explanation that had come along and refused to reconduct the experiment under the properly controlled conditions. Now, here is why I mentioned Miss Dukas's name, um, Einstein's secretary. At the time, all of Einstein's mail was being screened by her. And she might have had her own reasons for not wanting her employer to confirm Reich's findings. When they entered the country, the United States, in 1933, both Ms. Dukas and Dr. Einstein were put under fairly close FBI observation. They were aware, of course, of the great scientists' leftist-leaning sympathies, but they, more importantly, strongly suspected Ms. Dukas of being an active asset of Soviet intelligence since at least 1929. So for the Soviets to have an active agent in place as the secretary to Einstein, who, again, liked her, she knew his routines, he had no cause to dismiss her, he thought of her, I think, as he thought of himself, as a leftist-leaning progressive person, but probably was too busy and caught up in too many more (laughs) ethereal thoughts uh, and scientific thoughts to consider her an actual Soviet spy. Mm -hmm. Again, the Soviets were out to destroy Reich's reputation in any way that they could. And it's also important to note here that about this time, Einstein would already have been drafted into a project called the Manhattan Project and been very involved in developing the first nuclear bomb and certainly had interests that on their own, even if he had not been sort of directed away from Reich's work in not having the time or the interest perhaps in replicating this experiment properly Mm -hmm. um, and maybe felt who needed to? If it was true, 
a great deal of what his reputation was built on and that of other physicists would be open to question that organomy as such and Reich's study of how energy functioned in this specific realm might be problematic to his work, his philosophy, etc. There we have that. Now, Reich had trained other physician psychiatrists in the method that he had developed coming way out of Freud. It, it involved very little talk and a lot of physical activity. And I know it not in an intellectual way, but having done it for almost seven years of my life and appreciated the benefits of it. But the FDA, which now is a problem enough for us, at the time was really run by not much more than a bunch of thugs, were looking to take Reich down. Their red flag was that coming into this period that was going to be the McCarthy era and out of a period in American public life that was fairly sexually tamped down at the edges, right. that he posed a threat to the American public because he was interested in sex and this weird energy. And, you know, their problem, though, was that no one had ever once registered a complaint about Dr. Reich, about any of the therapists that he had trained, either with the AMA, the American Psychiatric Association, or with the FDA itself. But in 1947, a first negative article and a more vicious, more inaccurate article on Reich has never been published. It was called The Strange Case of Wilhelm Reich. The author was a woman named Mildred Edie Brady, and it appeared in the New Republic magazine, which, of course, is still in print. Had Reich followed the advice of his attorney and those closest to him and taken legal action against Ms. Brady for the scurrilous and, in fact, libelous remarks that she made, I think it would have shut her up and very little in the way of similar attacks would have followed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he did not do this. And shortly thereafter, the Time magazine published an article called The Marvelous Sex Box. Brady's article was read by more and more people, and you can go online and, and find uh, The Strange Case of Wilhelm Reich in The New Republic, published in May of 47, and read it for yourself. But it accused Reich of stating, which he never did, that the orgone accumulator was a cure-all. And Ms. Brady, we should note here, was not a routine freelancer. She had a history working actively with communist causes and was a person who seemed to have a real investment in bringing down Reich. Mm. Now, there's no question that the article was completely libelous. What we were also, what Reich was also not aware of at the time was that Brady was friends with Reich's actual lawyer, something that the lawyer never made public or never told his client. And in fact, they conspired together to a degree. Sad stuff for sure. Definitely. Ultimately, Reich went on from here to realize that he could continue to train therapists and do therapy himself, and that individuals would gain some real benefit from it. However, it would be the equivalent of trying to straighten out a fully grown, twisted tree. You can't do it. And he felt, although he encouraged and his therapists certainly continued and continue now to do the work, and there's a great deal of value to it, that he should put more of his attention on infants and what matters in bringing a healthy infant into the world and protecting its rights, its safety, its emotional health to have a potential to grow to be a healthy, happy, contributing human being. Right. And it's not hard to damage an infant. God knows we've all seen it done mm. with some, you know, poor, harassed mother screaming at a baby because she's hit her limit. It's, you know, Reich would call it the murder of Christ yet one more time. Hmm. He also felt that he needed to be in a place where he could conduct his experiments in a more open, natural atmosphere than Queens, New York, and ended up buying a very beautiful property 
in Rangeley, Maine, where he built a remarkable building. It is now, again, the Wilhelm Reich Museum. But when he was living there, it was his home, his laboratory, an observatory, a painting studio, a library, examination rooms, all integrated into one brilliant structure. In fact, I don't know if I've ever been in a building which is so intelligently designed to be a home and you move to another part of it, a laboratory, another part of it, examination rooms for patients, et cetera, mm. et cetera. He began to do a series of experiments in Maine, one involving a very small amount of radium in an accumulator. And the results that it produced were horrific. This tiny speck of obviously radioactive material in a simple accumulator toxified the entire area Damn. for months and made people working with Reich and in the general area ill. It took months to clean the area of the effects. But for anybody who feels that accumulators, you know, are nonsensical, try that experiment <laughs> yeah. for yourself and um, experience the results. So this brings us, Greg, up into the early 1950s. Okay. And at that time, working with his groundskeeper, he developed a very simple apparatus, again, bearing in mind all he had learned about how energy functions and when dealing with orgone energy, how the energetic potential flows from the stronger to the weaker rather than the weaker to the stronger as in conventional electricity. What he developed was a brilliant yet incredibly simple apparatus that came to be called the cloud buster. Water is an energetic attractor. And what he did was design the simple apparatus of metal pipes that basically standard cloud busters might be four over four or five over five of a certain appreciable length. He experimented with different metals and the pipes, again, were in sort of two rows, one over and one under. The back of each pipe was connected to a long piece of industrial BX cable with the wiring pulled out. Again, this is the larger equivalent of the BX cable that snakes through all of our homes with wiring in it. It was mounted in a manner that could be adjusted for elevation and for direction. And using this apparatus with the BX cable ends grounded in his pond on his property in Rangeley, he aimed the pipes in an easterly direction. Now, at the time, there was also a drought in the area of South Maine that he lived. And his thought was perhaps if the water actually grounded the energy and acted as an attractor, and you can do it in a pond, in running water, in a well, in still water, but again, the larger amount of water and the movement potential certainly doesn't hurt, that it would begin to create movement in the atmosphere where moisture-rich air, not that far away over the Atlantic, would be drawn in a westerly direction and ultimately increase the humidity index in the air, hypothetically leading to a point where it might create rain. Hmm. Well, it certainly did increase the humidity in the air and did create rain, so much so that the drought conditions in that area of Maine went away. In the surrounding area, they remained, which was not surprisingly of interest to farmers as well as local folks who were aware of what he was doing. He certainly didn't keep it secret. And... In October of 53, he, I guess that's really when he dates, when we have to date his interest in the UFO phenomena, 
because that's when they started to appear over his property. And there is no question that this happened. He observed it. People in Rangeley observed it. People in the surrounding area did. And certainly the scientists, physicians, therapists coming and going from his property or working there, and the students as well, observed UFO phenomena over the property. He read his first two books on UFOs at that time. And for those listeners who are somewhat well-versed on the subject of UFOs, you should be aware that they were flying saucers from outer space by Donald E. Kehoe, a highly respected retired Marine Corps major who was a fighter pilot during World War II, and arguably the father of the real scientific study of UFOs. Kehoe's books are still worth reading. The second book that Reich read was E.J. Ruppelt's report on UFOs. Ruppelt had been, as a captain in the Air Force, head of Project Blue Book at one time, uh, an important public relations effort on the part of the Air Force masquerading as a genuine aspect of of UFO studies um, really wasn't. A quote here is important. After reading the Ruppelt book, Reich wrote, the Ruppelt report on UFOs clearly reveals the helplessness of mechanistic method in coming to grips with the problem posed by the spacemen. The cosmic orgone energy which these living beings are using in their technology is beyond the grasp of mechanistic science since cosmic laws of functioning are not mechanical, but what I term functional. The helplessness of mechanical thinking appears in the tragic shortcomings of our fastest fighter jets to make and hold contact with UFOs. Being unavoidably outdistanced is not a flattering situation for military pride. The conclusion seems correct. Mechanistic methods of locomotion must be counted out in coping with the spaceship problem. Now, that statement, among others, is almost outrageously prophetic. Reich, early on, observed, and I think rightly concluded, that the propulsive systems of these truly anomalous UFOs went beyond any kind of motor that we could visualize as human beings, certainly in the 1950s, and that somehow, The propulsive systems of UFOs, which I have no idea how they function, however, I think Reich was correct and that they somehow have been able to harness this sea of energy, which they move through from wherever they originate to Earth where we observe them. Now, in March of 54, he sent a copy of his writing developed at that point on UFOs to the Air Force. It was an actual manuscript. Right. And a lot of the stuff he was studying here had implications that were pretty far reaching outside of just our earthly environment, right? When all was said and done, basic to Reich's understanding of the universe was the pervasive presence of this energy, which he called orgon, implying the possibility of life in space, Mm -hmm. which is something that we now fully acknowledge even on the most conservative ideas put forward by astronomers. At this time, Reich's questioning encompassed a great deal more than human neuroses and armoring and health and infants and weather systems. He was looking at how galactic currents work, the formation and destruction of star systems, the origins of the universe itself. And again, along with his deepening involvement in cloud busting, he now began it's just amazing the way this mind, the, this man's mind worked in terms of nuts and bolts scientific thinking. He now began a careful examination of the stars themselves and set about to prove that some stars did not behave like others and, in fact, were UFOs. I remember when I first read about this stuff, Greg, it all appears in a book called Contact with Space, which is absolutely brilliant. And the last book that he wrote, it was published a month after he died, posthumously in December of 1957. 
However, it was only printed in an edition of 500. Even if you're not interested in organomy, oh boy, what a valuable book to have in your library. I know a handful of people who actually have editions of the book, like most readers of the book. I have long had a first-generation copy made and sold at the bookstore of the Wilhelm Reich uh, Museum in Rangeley, Maine. Hmm. But I would also say that Contact with Space is probably the worst first book of Dr. Wilhelm Reich's to read. It is based on more than 35 years of scientific study, experimentation, theoretical thinking, proving for himself in a way that makes perfect sense going from one subject to another when you understand how energy functioning cuts across all of his interests going back to Freud and into the world of galactic formations, UFOs, etc. But to read it as a first book, where he is simply going on about the reality of UFOs and cloud busting for a lay person, especially somebody who is predisposed to think that he was not mentally all there. It ain't the best book to start with, but an essential book to any serious student of his work. And in contact with space, again, brilliant nuts and bolts thinking about how do you establish certain things that are so sweeping with conventional apparatus. And what he did in this examination of stars was use nocturnal time-lapse photography. The investigative technique was simply using a 35 millimeter camera, which was mounted on a tripod, carefully set to face the night sky with the shutter open and the experiment produced some unexpected results. The huge majority of stars, of course, cause a slight line as the Earth rotates in the course of a night. And, you know, that's what you get, this huge series of lines in this circle revolving uh, around, you know, the North Star. Some of the stars, obviously, the, the stars, the real stars produce the white lines indicating the Earth's rotation. Mm -hmm. However, a small number of other dots of light that were there to start with simply vanished mm -hmm. in the course of that open shutter during the night, indicating that they were not stars. And in fact, the only logical deduction was that they were truly anomalous UFOs. I should also say here, I'm using the term UFOs, but flying saucers was still the accepted term in that point in the 1950s. It wasn't until 55 or certainly 1956 when the term unidentified flying object or UFO actually emerged. So we're now in October, early October of that year, of 1953, and UFOs are being observed over the property as he continues cloud busting. And finally, he decides to do something that he had been hesitating, which was to aim the cloud buster at a UFO. And who knew what was going to happen? Was it you know, going to blast them with some, some scientific science fiction beam of light or what was going to happen. And again, I pulled up a quote here because I feel it's warranted at this point in my going on. Sure. I hesitated for weeks to turn my cloud buster pipes toward a star, in quotes, as if I had known that some of the blinking lights hanging in the sky were not planets or stars but space machines. When I saw the quote-unquote star to the west fade out four times in succession, what had been left of the old world of human knowledge tumbled beyond retrieve. From now on, everything, anything was possible. There was no mistake about it. Three more people had seen it. There was only one conclusion. The thing we, we had drawn from was not a star. It was something else. And I take it back. The term UFO was in, 
being used at that time, a UFO. The shock of this experience was great enough not to repeat such an action until 10 October 1954. Well, Reich and his scientists working with him decided that what needed to be done in the same way that before presenting his findings to Einstein, he had to establish his findings in such concrete scientific terms that the world of establishment scientists would have a real challenge in refuting them. Mm -hmm. And so what they set about to do was find an area where he could conduct weather modification work with the intention of creating rain in an area where it did not rain for such a long time and in such an amount that the cloudbuster work itself would have to be seen as the cause of the rain. They established fairly early on that the driest area in the United States was in Death Valley, but it was not practical to conduct cloud busting experiments there. The area that they settled on was just outside of Tucson, Arizona, where he leased 10 acres on the prairie right outside of Tucson. And that summer, he and a small cadre of colleagues, including his daughter, Dr. Eva Reich, who was a physician, Dr. Baker, for some of the time, who was my therapist when I was in medical orgone therapy in the 1980s and the 70s, late 70s. Dr. Eva Reich's husband, who was a man named uh, William Moyce, who was a trained cloudbuster operator, and others drove two cloudbusters out from Maine to this area in Arizona where they set up and began to work. And over the next weeks, the energetic potential, the humidity, the relative humidity index in the air began to build. Very exciting, certainly. And I should say this was not in the summer. This was already autumn in October of 54. Once they had settled in, they commenced their drawing operations, which was the term applied to cloud busting, regularly observing the atmosphere with the meteorological instruments, recording every aspect of what they were observing in accordance with strict scientific method. And Dr. Reich also encouraged all present to keep individual journals, which were also maintained. By November 7th, and they began work the 19th or the 20th, by November 7th, the usual humidity index, relative humidity, so to say, of 15, uh, of, let's see, of, had risen, I'm sorry, from its usual 15 or so percent to 65 percent, which was unheard of for the Tucson area. Drawing continued from the southwest direction, again, drawing from ultimately the Pacific Ocean area. And on November 7th, the first clouds were forming and indicated that it would rain soon. They then observed without apparent explanation, the clouds beginning to compose. It was then they observed a large, bright UFO coming up from the north. The struggle, so to say, continued over the next weeks. The humidity index kept rising. UFOs would appear, and the humidity index would dramatically drop. It is also worth noting here that in Tucson, there is a very distinguished institution called the Institute of Atmospheric Physics. It was founded in 1953, interestingly, as a direct result of the formation of President Eisenhower's advisory board on weather control earlier that year. Eisenhower was very interested in potential methods to affect the weather. One can theorize that perhaps part of it was 
interest in weather as a weapon, but certainly in farming and in creating rain where there was none, in busting droughts. It would be a very valuable tool to have. The administrator of the um, Institute for Atmospherics was a good friend of Eisenhower's named Lou Douglas, who was also a major fundraiser for the Republican Party. And Douglas had hired a brilliant atmospheric physicist named Dr. James McDonald, who was working at the newly established Institute for Atmospheric Physics in Tucson at the exact time that Wilhelm Reich was overseeing cloud busting operations at the edge of Tucson right then and there. Dr. McDonald certainly would have had a genuine interest in Reich's work, but we don't know if the two actually ever met and talked. We do know that a local television program filmed the cloud busting operation at a certain point and that McDonald was seen, that he was watching it at a distance. Reich was not on location at that moment, so it's interesting to wonder about this. The reason I bring it up is because this brilliant, decent man, James McDonald, who, again, was an atmospheric physicist, whether or not he was able to connect with Reich, whatever his interest in, was in cloud busting, he emerged some years later as the most significant proponent for scientific ufology and the study of ufology to be taken very seriously by the American scientific establishment put his life and his reputation on the line to try to create this Herculean effect in the scientific community, was beaten down, was made fun of, was taken to task by not just the scientific community, but members of Congress when he testified about the viability of a supersonic transport, which ultimately emerged as the Concorde in the late 60s, early 70s, to such a degree that it broke him, contributed to massive depression that he experienced and ultimately to his untimely and tragic suicide. Off on a tangent, but I think an important one. By the 13th of November, Greg, the cloud busting operation was showing amazing results. The relative humidity had risen to 67 degrees. There was foliage observable on mountain ranges that could be seen from Tucson, something that had never been observed wow. in modern times, that the mountain ranges were turning green. For me, you know, as a layperson with a passionate interest in aspects of science, obviously Dr. Reich's work, which has governed a certain amount of my life for most of my life, the same things that I apply as an investigative writer in UFOs, looking for small details, human details, simple scientific details that illuminate the bigger story emerge right here. Several weeks, a week two weeks before it actually began to rain and broke every weather record in the history of Arizona, still to this day, prairie grass began to spontaneously sprout up in the acreage of the leased site hmm. where they were doing the cloud busting operation. And I want your listeners to take a moment and think about that, that dormant seeds in that sand for decades and decades. And, you know, seeds are amazing things. We Seeds that were in the Great Pyramid for millennia have been sprouted. And there are other examples of that. It's, it's just one of the great miracles of, of the way that life functions on this amazing planet. That grass began to grow around the site. There was that much moisture in the air before it actually began raining. I know I've been going on for a long time, obviously, the two hours we've allotted for this show. This is such a huge subject. Dr. Sure. Reich's work for me has filled decades of my life and made it a much more fulfilling life than I think it might have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. But to sum things up and then go to whatever questions we have time for, 
in the next day or so, the temperature dropped to 47% humidity. The humidity dropped to 47%, not the temperature. It was accompanied by major UFO activity, and I mean flashing, pulsating UFOs um, in the air, observed by people in Tucson. This is not some, you know, crazy conspiratorial story. This was being seen by the public many of whom were increasingly interested in Reich's weather modification work. Ultimately, it resulted in what Reich described as something like a battle between UFO activity and cloud-busting activity. And ultimately, in December, and I'm, I'm kind of compressing the story here tremendously, it not only rained, but it snowed at the Tucson airport. I believe on the Christmas day uh, of of 1954 every weather record in the history of the state of Arizona was broken it rained so hard that drainage ditches that had not seen rain for more than half a century flooded out and people who had built their homes in those drainage ditches over the preceding decades were flooded out. Snow could be seen on Mount Catalina. 2,000 families had to be evacuated from the perennially dry riverbed where they had built their homes. Mm -hmm. The rain moved on to Texas and New Mexico, while the Phoenix Valley experienced fog for the first time in memory. It went on and on from there and into January. A local bank had approached Dr. Reich with an offer to fund his continuing work in the area. Local farmers asked to meet with him to learn the techniques and begin this weather modification on their own. And then history interceded in another way. The FDA, which again had been trying for years to destroy Reich, managed to create legislation that was fair enough that Reich's orgone energy accumulators, which were being manufactured on a one-by-one manufacturing schedule out of the Rangeley location, and being shipped to people interested in them, um, the FDA was able to get an injunction against interstate shipping of accumulators and classifying them as experimental medical or scientific devices, which was fair enough. Unfortunately, one of Reich's physicians, a brilliant clinician and a very decent man named Michael Silvert, screwed up and he shipped panels for an accumulator out of state. And so an injunction was created. It happened right at this moment in this extraordinary moment in Arizona, and Reich decided to return to Maine and against, once again, the advice of all who cared about him, as well as the people who had his best um, best interest. Yes, exactly, in mind, that he decided that he would take personal responsibility, absolving the clinician who actually shipped the panels, although Dr. Silvert was consumed with guilt about having done so, more that he would use the court case as an opportunity to present the validity of his work in an American court. Well, it blew up against him in several ways. Number one, his attorney, who really had been conspiring against him for years and was a friend of the judge who had the case, really let him down. And his attempt to present his the validity of his work would absolutely not be um, accepted by the court. He was judged guilty of interstate shipment of a scientific, unproven scientific uh, medical device and was sentenced to a year in prison, which he served in Lewisburg State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. It broke him, though. And I should also say that starting at this time, 
up until 1960 or so, several years after his death, and several months before the inauguration of President Kennedy, more than eight tons of Reich's original scientific literature, first edition public books, monographs, pamphlets, case histories were destroyed in government incinerators. Why? Because the FDA had managed in their injunction to state that Orgone Energy was a hoax, a fraud, a fantasy, and any reference to it, they had the right to burn books. Many of the books that were burned made no mention of Orgone Energy, but it might have been included in a description of one of his other books on the back of the book jacket or in the flyleaf. Dr. Reich was found dead in his prison cell about a week before he was due to be discharged from prison on parole. I know from Dr. Baker and having spoken with his daughter when she was still alive, Dr. Eva Reich, that he had completed a manuscript for a book that the working title was Creation. Dr. Baker had read a certain amount of it. He said it was the most brilliant work that he had yet published, and that manuscript, not surprisingly, was missing. My guess is that the FBI has it, and that it's with, you know, material that was confiscated from Tesla's hotel room when he passed away in 42, as I recall. But this has been the most compressed, concise, sort of transistorized version of Dr. Reich's life and work. For anyone interested in reading a serious biography of Dr. Reich, and his books can be found online, the book that I would recommend is called Fury on Earth. And it was written by Dr. Myron Sharaf, who was a student of Dr. Reich's and a friend of mine. It's a very important book, a powerful biography, and will probably stand as the definitive biography of, of Dr. Reich. You can find his books used all over the place. My favorite place, uh, one of them, is a book service called Abe Books. That's Abe is an Abe Lincoln, A-B-E books.com. Although, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, I don't know if any of his books are in print right now, but there are more than 20 books that are out there and new books appearing irregularly as the estate is able to cull the information from the extraordinary archive that was basically locked up at Reich's request for 50 years and opened. It was a vault in Portland, Maine, and that is the basic story, and happy to go to whatever questions you might have that I may be able to answer, Greg. Absolutely, man. Damn, that was a great breakdown. Thanks for laying it all out and basically walking us through the important bullet points in the life of Dr. Reich. We have gone a bit past what is the typical half point for one of these episodes, but for the sake of not breaking up a good story, we'll just end the free show here, and I'll ask you some questions for the plus side. But before we do close it out, is there anything else you'd like to tell the people about Reich's work or your own or where they can follow up with you? Well, just that any of your listeners that have found our conversation and my rambling here interesting enough to pursue it, go online. and buy some books by Wilhelm Reich. You can find used copies for a couple of bucks each and read them and read them. There are occasionally 